v. Absolute or Immanent Attributes First Division. Spirituality, and Attributes Therein Involved In calling spirituality an attribute of God, we mean, not that we are justified in applying to the divine nature the adjective, spiritual, but that the substantive, spirit, describes that nature, John 4 verse 24, Mark, God is spirit, Romans 1 verse 20, the invisible things of him, 1 Tim. 117, incorruptible, invisible, Colossians 1 verse 15, the invisible God. This implies, negatively, that a, God is not matter. Spirit is not a refined form of matter, but an immaterial substance, invisible, uncompounded, indisruptible. b, God is not dependent upon matter. It cannot be shown that the human mind, in any other state than the present, is dependent for consciousness upon its connection with a physical organism. Much less is it true that God is dependent upon the material universe as his sensorium. God is not only spirit, but he is pure spirit. He is not only not matter, but he has no necessary connection with matter, Luke 24 verse 39, a spirit of not flesh and bones, as ye behold me having. John gives us the three characteristic attributes of God when he says that God is spirit, light, love, John for 24. 1 John 1 verse 5, for colon 8, not a spirit, a light, a love. Le Conti, in Royce's conception of God, 45, God is spirit, for spirit is essential life and essential energy, an essential love, an essential thought, in a word, essential person. Biedermann, Dogmatic, 631, Das Wiesen des Geists als des reinen Gegensatzes zur Materie, ist das reine Sein, das in sich ist, aber nicht die ist. Martino, Study, 2 366, the subjective ego is always here, as opposed to all else, which is variously there. Without local relations, therefore, the soul is inaccessible. But, Martino continues, if matter be but centers of force, all the soul needs may be centers from which to act. Romans, Mind and Motion, 34, because within the limits of human experience mind is only known as associated with brain, it does not follow that mind cannot exist in any other mode. Laplace swept the heavens with his telescope, but could not find anywhere a god. He might just as well, says President Sawyer, have swept his kitchen with a broom. Since God is not a material being, he cannot be apprehended by any physical means. Those passages of scripture which seem to ascribe to God the possession of bodily parts and organs, as eyes and hands, are to be regarded as anthropomorphic and symbolic. When God is spoken of as appearing to the patriarchs and walking with them, the passages are to be explained as referring to God's temporary manifestations of himself in human form, manifestations which prefigured the final tabernacling of the Son of God in human flesh. Side by side with these anthropomorphic expressions and manifestations, moreover, are specific declarations which repress any materializing conceptions of God, as, for example, that heaven is his throne and the earth his footstool, is 66 to 1, and that the heaven of heavens cannot contain him, 1 K, 827. X 33 colon 1820 declares that man cannot see God and live, 1 Cor 2 colon 716 intimates that without the teaching of God's spirit we cannot know God, all this teaches that God is above sensuous perception, in other words, that he is not a material being. The second command of the Decalogue does not condemn sculpture and painting, but only the making of images of God. It forbids our conceiving God after the likeness of a thing, but it does not forbid our conceiving God after the likeness of our inward self, I. E. As personal. This again shows that God is a spiritual being. Imagination can be used in religion, and great help can be derived from it. Yet we do not know God by imagination. Imagination only helps us vividly to realize the presence of the God whom we already know. We may almost say that some men have not imagination enough to be religious. But imagination must not lose its wings. In its representations of God, it must not be confined to a picture, or a form, or a place. Humanity tends too much to rest in the material and the sensuous and we must avoid all representations of God which would identify the being who is worshipped with the helps used in order to realize his presence, John 4 verse 24, they that worship him must worship in spirit and truth. An Egyptian hymn to the Nile, dating from the 19th dynasty, 14th century B, C, contains these words, 
His abode is not known, no shrine is found with painted figures, there is no building that can contain him, Cheney, Isaiah, 2 120. The repudiation of images among the ancient Persians, Herod. 1 131, as among the Japanese Shintos, indicates the remains of a primitive spiritual religion. The representation of Jehovah with body or form degrades him to the level of heathen gods. Pictures of the Almighty over the chancels of Romanist cathedrals confine the mind and degrade the conception of the worshipper. We may use imagination in prayer, picturing God as a benignant form holding out arms of mercy, but we should regard such pictures only as scaffolding for the building of our edifice of worship, while we recognize, with the scripture, that the reality worshipped is immaterial and spiritual. Otherwise our idea of God is brought down to the low level of man's material. Being even man's spiritual nature may be misrepresented. By physical images, as when medieval artists pictured death, by painting a doll-like figure leaving the body at the mouth of the person dying. The longing for a tangible, incarnate God meets its satisfaction in Jesus Christ. Yet even pictures of Christ soon lose their power. Luther said, if I have a picture of Christ in my heart, why not one upon canvas? We answer, because the picture in the heart is capable of change and improvement, as we ourselves change and improve, the picture upon canvas is fixed, and holds to old conceptions which we should outgrow. Thomas Carlyle Men never think of painting the face of Christ, till they lose the impression of him upon their hearts. Swedenborg, in modern times, represents the view that God exists in the shape of a man, an anthropomorphism of which the making of idols is only a grosser and more barbarous form, C. H. B. Smith, System of Theology, 9, 10. This is also the doctrine of Mormonism, C. Spencer, Catechism of Latter-day Saints. The Mormons teach that God is a man, that he has numerous wives by whom he peoples space with an infinite number of spirits. Christ was a favorite son by a favorite wife, but birth as man was the only way he could come into the enjoyment of real life. These spirits are all the sons of God, but they can realize and enjoy their sonship only through birth. They are about every one of us pleading to be born. Hence, polygamy. We come now to consider the positive import of the term spirit. The spirituality of God involves the two attributes of life and personality.